Paul Clemens. And I worked on makeup effects for One Dark Night. Before I became an actor, I actually um, thought of being a makeup artist. I got to know Dick Smith, and he was wonderful and very generous and uh, helped me with various things. And so, you know, I had, uh, I had a couple makeup kits, and from a very young age, of like nine years old, I was already starting to transform myself into various ghouls and the Hunchback and Mr. Hyde and Abraham Lincoln and Mark Twain and, you know, you name it. So I was very much into makeup and uh, my idol at that time was Lon Chaney Sr. for obvious reasons. And, uh, and, um, and then when I saw what makeup could do for me as an actor, well, um, I did not do, of course, my own makeup in any of the film work I've done, but I certainly did for various uh, stage work that I did over the years. So my knowledge of makeup uh, held me in you know, good stead for that. Tom, I knew, was uh, preparing to do uh, this film, One Dark Night, for which they were going to need a great uh, many uh, corpses in various stages of decomposition. And uh, Tom knew that not only was I interested in makeup effects and had, you know, some skill at it, but he knew I was a, uh, um, a pretty good sculptor. And uh, so uh, it was kind of a natural fit. And um, I don't remember whether I asked him or he asked me, but I, I certainly uh, jumped at the opportunity to join his crew uh, for that film. And... Um, and in fact, uh, a very good friend of mine at the time, Lisa Morton, who's an award-winning uh, fantasy, uh, dark fantasy writer. So anyway, um, Lisa and I uh, both went to work for Tom uh, on that project. There were some interesting aspects, shall we say, to the experience. Um, we used as one of our reference tools uh, a book called The Color Atlas of Forensic Pathology. And this book had the most horrific images imaginable in it. Uh, but so inured did we become after a while uh, working with this material that uh, after, after, you know, a couple weeks, um, I'd be, you know, munching on a sandwich for lunch while looking at these horrific pictures of drowned bodies and decayed corpses and murder victims. And, you know, here I am eating a sandwich. Um, um, but it was, anyway, it was a very educational experience for one thing. Um, I learned about mold making. Um, I learned about different sculpting techniques other than ones I'd been familiar with. For example, um, the main um, corpse that I sculpted for the film um, was uh, of a woman, a blonde haired woman, long blonde hair, uh, wearing a long white dress uh, fairly decayed, um, and uh, holding a Bible and a crucifix and prayer beads hanging from her hands. And she comes drifting down the corridor of the uh, mausoleum, uh, Hollywood Forever Cemetery is where it was shot, and, or at least those sequences. And um, I, did, I did several pieces. We all worked on various bodies in various stages of decomposition, but each of us kind of had our uh, particular sort of hero uh, corpse or body that we had, you know, lavished the most time on. Uh, the one Lisa did that was her sort of hero one was a, a wonderful, creepy little girl, a little dead girl mummified, uh, holding, uh, clutching a doll, a little doll, and she was kind of pathetic, and that was great. And, uh, and mine was this, you know, dead woman with the, with the Bible and uh, prayer beads. And... Um, I remember um, for the arms of that figure, um, interesting approach to that. Rather than sculpting them from scratch, from plasticine or, or clay, water-based clay, um, instead, uh, wax positives were made from a mold of a woman's arms, a young woman, normal-looking hands and arms, uh, up to past the elbow, as I recall. And... Um, and then I was given these, and um, metal sculpting tools, or really dental tools is what they were, the tools that dentists use to sculpt um, special, 
you know, um, dental appliances with. And um, using these, these uh, metal tools, I began carving uh, into the wax, which was fairly hard wax. It, was not, it wasn't easily carved. It, it, you needed these sharp, uh, special tools to do it. And um, uh, while using reference photos of various examples of atrophy and decay, um, I tried pretty much to duplicate a lot of the elements from various photos that I was seeing uh, in the hard wax. And uh, it was not a speedy process, but it worked really well. And uh, you, could, you could really control what you were doing. And if there was a problem, if something if too much had come off, you can always add more melted wax, which will then harden. And so it was an you know, uh, interesting substance to, to work with, interesting material. Um, so that's how I did the, the hands and arms. Uh, the face, the, the head, the neck, all of that was sculpted. Um, on an armature. Now, we, we did use um, actual skeletons. I checked with Lisa on this because my memory was a little hazy as to whether... I know we use skeletons at certain points, but I couldn't remember whether they were, they were sort of replica acrylic uh, skeletons, you know, resin, or were these uh, actual skeletons. And she told me that Tom had said at the time that um, actually the skeletons that we were using were from India and that they were real skeletons and that because they came from India they got a real bargain on the price they were actually much cheaper than the replica ones would have been totally illegal now to do that needless to say this was way back in the day and um, so, yes, some real skeletons, I guess, were used. I don't, as I say, I don't really remember. I, I remember seeing them. I don't remember actually working with them. I know stuff was... I did sculpt another face, which was then produced in a kind of slip rubber, and uh, holes were cut for the eyes and mouth, and then this, it was painted, and then this, uh, this rubber face and head and neck was glued onto a skeleton, onto a real skull, uh, and made to fit around the eye sockets and the teeth and the whole thing. So, and that was a very, a much more decayed, more mummified looking one than the dead woman that I sculpted, uh, more far gone. And for those bodies that were really far gone, they did use that method a lot where they would, uh, almost like building a scarecrow, using a uh, skeleton as, a, uh, as an armature, if you will. So, um, but the, the dead woman that I sculpted, the, the face, the head, the neck, the whole, it was very, very detailed, and again, using uh, reference photos from these books on pathology. And um, uh, I remember her teeth um, were, those were not real. They looked real, but they were acrylic, little acrylic teeth that you, uh, you can get. Dentists use them. And then once I was done with uh, the sculpting of that, as I recall, that's what I was learning, the mold making process. And I don't think I made the entire mold on my own. I had assistance because I hadn't really made molds before. But uh, I learned as I went and assisted in the molding of it. And then once that was produced in uh, thick, um, rubber, then it was uh, painted and haired, the wig was put on and so forth, and, and the rest was costuming and lighting and so forth. And I wasn't there for the actual shooting of the film, though I did get to know some of the actors, um, E.G. Daly, I remember her, and so on. But, uh, and uh, the director, uh, Tom McLaughlin, was a great guy. Uh, I have always enjoyed when he came around, he was very supportive. And, uh, and, you know, he liked what he was seeing, and he, of course, would have various um, suggestions and so on. We worked very easily and well with him, and uh, I remember I stayed in touch with him for a while after that just because he was a you know, really neat guy, and I thought he did a, a damn good job with the film, considering it was, you know, very low budget, and, uh, but it was very atmospheric. Uh, it was Meg Tilly's very first film role, I believe. Um, I was at the cast and crew screening, and uh, um, I was very pleased with it. It was better than I thought it was going to be. Uh, it had some genuinely eerie, unnerving moments, I thought, you know, for, for a low-budget uh, horror film of that nature. I thought it was, uh, you know, a cut above, and also it, it got its effects without resorting to a lot of, you know, excessive gore, which was refreshing at the time, since that was the height of the, you know, 
slasher stuff. Looking at a thing that features my work as a makeup effects sculptor, which, by the way, I've done in other films as well. I did a film called The Outing, also called The Lamp. It goes by two titles where I sculpted uh, along with uh, William Forsh, very talented uh, guy. Together we sculpted this uh, like 12 foot tall evil genie. Um, and uh, that was a lot of fun. And um, then I also did a thing um, called, what was it called? The Haunting of Winchester House or something like that. It, um, where I sculpted this weird uh, mutant baby with, with like no eyes. It was just a gaping, creepy mouth. and so forth. So yeah, I have a, a few makeup effects credits. What I did go on to do was uh, become, at the time, a somewhat in-demand um, sculptor of collectible uh, masks, uh, busts. Uh, they really, nobody ever really wore them uh, as, as masks. They were like made to be displayed, really. They could have been worn as masks, but I never knew them to be. People always collected them for display purposes and um, for a group called the Halloween Society. And these have now become really sought after collector's items, uh, which I wasn't aware of uh, until a while back when I started hearing all these stories. And uh, one night I was at a uh, party in uh, North Hollywood and, um, and uh, somebody uh, found out who I was, that I had sculpted those masks. And this guy literally got down on his knees and began to do this thing going, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I mean, thank you, but <laughs> uh, I wasn't expecting that response. But they're very, very uh, hard to get. That's why they were made in very limited runs. Uh, I think we made 13 of each, and then the molds were destroyed. So uh, because they were made in such limited runs, uh, and um, they were quite elaborate pieces, uh, they became very hard to get and thus very sought after by collectors. So uh, I'm proud of my involvement in that. It was not just me, it was uh, myself and I think two or three other sculptors. Um, I did um, Charles Lawton's Hunchback of Notre Dame for that series, um, uh, Cheney Jr.'s The Wolfman, Boris Karloff's The Mummy, uh, Lon Chaney Sr.'s London After Midnight. I definitely did uh, Peter Laurie in Mad Love, and also uh, Max Schreck uh, in Nosferatu. Uh, I continued doing you know, various uh, film and TV work. Um, and, uh, but as I said, watching the cast and crew screening of One Dark Night, I was really concentrating on the effects work that I had done for that. So I wasn't really critiquing the other actors in it or saying, oh, gee, I should have been in that. Or, you know, besides, I didn't really see a role that I thought I would have been actually right for in that particular film anyway. So. Again, I'm sure stuff happened during the making of the film. Doubtless Tom McLaughlin will have a bunch of stories and anecdotes because he directed the actual film. Uh, I saw very little of that. I was, you know, um, squirreled away in uh, the Bourbon Studios working in this, you know, big makeup lab uh, day in and day out, you know, producing uh, creepy dead bodies, you know, uh, cadavers. So uh, I didn't really have an opportunity to... Uh, be privy to uh, you know stuff uh, ha you know, mishaps on the set, for example. I can tell you nothing like that happened at the Bourbon Studios when we were working on the film. No, no, nothing burst into flames, and uh, there were no uh, disastrous accidents. So. Other people on it, I just there was Tom Herber. I can't remember. I'm not remembering the names of all the. There were you know a lot of people, but we were so you know it was so many years ago, and we were so focused on what we were doing. The one person that sticks most vividly in mind, because we were very good friends for a long time, old friends, that was Lisa Morton. So, and Lisa, by the way, Lisa Morton, she went on to do, or had already done, I think at that time, uh, a lot of very impressive special effects work, not makeup uh, sculpting work, but uh, miniatures, uh, miniature work uh, uh, for uh, a number of films. She worked on uh, Star Trek, the motion picture, V'ger, the V'ger sequences. She worked on uh, Close Encounters for the Third Kind, the special edition where you go inside the ship. She worked on that. She worked on uh, The Abyss for James Cameron and uh, with the, the underwater sub miniatures and divers and 
so forth. Very, very talented woman, and now she's a marvelous writer and uh, you know, widely published. And interestingly enough, she is probably, not even probably, I would say she is the world's foremost expert on the subject of Halloween. She's literally written, I think, four or five books on the subject. She's been in documentaries, interviewed whenever they do stuff about Halloween. She's the go-to girl for that. So, yeah, she's uh, multifaceted. I don't know where that weird affectation came from with this dry tooth. She's always using this toothbrush. Uh, uh, like in the old days, the way someone would be chewing on a toothpick or something. She's, she's there with this, with this toothbrush on it. That was a, a, a very strange little uh, affectation, but I don't know where that came from. Well, you know, they're not, uh, the bodies, not, not this is, a, a, I guess, a, a spoiler for those who haven't seen the movie. So if you haven't seen the film, turn off the interview before you hear this. Um, but uh, these bodies are reanimated by telekinesis. They do not come, they're not zombies. They do not come back to life. These things may have well have been may as well have been pieces of furniture uh, floating around. And, you know, they, they have no uh, they have animation. Uh, they're being controlled by a sort of telekinetic madman who himself is a kind of a zombie. I mean, he has powers that um, exist beyond the grave. Uh, even though he died, his powers did not die, and so his character reanimates these bodies but uh, with no uh, intelligence. I mean, they are, they're controlled by an intelligence, but the bodies themselves are still as dead as they ever were, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, hey folks, buy this Blu-ray, now. <laughs> what, what more is there to say?